so. Euodia and Syntyche are bickering. Over what? We do not know. We have no idea what it is that has come between them. But we do know this, that the argument between them was enough of an issue that someone in Philippi said, Paul needs to know about this. So they wrote a letter, or went themselves to Paul, and told Paul what was happening between these two. And upon hearing it, Paul knew he needed to do something. And so then he wrote his letter back to them. Now, Paul has a fraught track record when it comes to the opinions of women within his letters. People often use the letters and the words of Paul to justify the judging of women, the diminishing of women, and this letter is among them. It, is, it does not stand apart. People use passages like this to uh, quiet women's voices. Oh, these two. They just can't get along, can they? <laughs> women, am I right? So catty, so petty, wasting Paul's precious time and energy with their quarreling. Don't they know he has important work, real work to do? But no, he's got to stop and deal with these two. <laughs> Women, you can't live with them. You can't run a church without them. People specifically sometimes, people specifically point to this passage when it comes to uh, uh, keeping women out of leadership roles within churches, within uh, Christian organizations and companies to diminish their wisdom and their authority that women have a place and that they should go there. They should stick there. And they lift up Euodia and Syntyche as an example of this. However, this understanding of this letter is terminally impoverished because it does three things. First, it willfully ignores the role that women played in the early church. Two, it puts words and opinions in Paul's mouth. And three, holding on to a reading like this, leaves the reader dumbed down to a point where they fail to be changed or edified by the word of God through Paul's message. They can't get over the fact that there are women in this book. So, let's take them each in turn. One, the early church grew safely through its infancy and into its strength because of the women who came to follow Jesus Christ. This is not just a feel-good statement. This is historical fact, historical data. One of the reasons for this was that the early church was one of the only places in Roman society where women could have broad authority, not just in domestic things, but in areas of governance and finance and theology. They were listened to, their ideas were followed, their inspirations were put into action. And this culture within the early church was especially intriguing to educated and wealthy women who wanted and who were capable of so much more than what Roman society had to offer them. They heard about these followers of Jesus, followers of the way, who organized themselves by ability and not by man or woman, Jew or Greek, slave or free. They heard the story of Jesus and his teachings and came to become followers themselves. Wealthy women financed the functioning of the early church, sponsoring the travels of missionaries as they were, like Paul, for example, and the local missionaries from their communities. They balanced and determined how the money they held in common would be used, helping each other take care of their daily needs. Wise and educated women took and gave counsel, studied scripture, and organized the functioning of these early communities. This truth, this is, this is evidence-based truth about our ancient church forebearers. And using this passage and ones like it as the justification to judge and, dismi and dismiss and belittle the gifts and talents of women is not only morally wrong, but factually incorrect. 
We have the information. We know this for a fact. We're talking about records from one of the greatest bureaucracies that humankind has known, the Roman Empire. We know this. And I use the phrase uh, historical data when talking about the role of women, but Paul instead, instead of saying historical data, he would say very relevant and critical truth to my work because, two, Paul knew how much the church needed women, and he does not use this letter to diminish their aptitude for leadership in, within it. In fact, I would say that it is precisely the opposite. Paul becomes involved in the quarrel between Euodia and Syntyche because they are wise, trusted leaders within their church who have earned their respect and authority. A schism between them would certainly be a schism within the church itself. Paul writes in the letter that they struggled alongside with him and others in the work for the gospel. These aren't Christmas and Easter churchgoers, if you know what I mean. These are important people. And the people of the church, they wouldn't just see these two fighting and then boot them out because of the tension between them. What do you think they would do? Well, they'd probably do the same thing that we sometimes do in our churches. They would pick sides. They'd rally behind the woman that they most trust and they most revere in the argument. This came across Paul's desk in the first place, not because it was hot gossip about what was happening in Philippi between Euodia and Syntyche. This was pressing business, akin to getting a note slid across your desk saying something like, the executive director and the, ch and the uh, board chair say they aren't going to work together anymore and they're fighting. He writes not because it is trivial, a waste of his time, but because he hears of two church leaders who are at odds and that their weight and their influence has such an impact that the badness between them would spread out. It just so happens that they are women. To choose to read this passage, to understand it, or teach it, or God help you preach it as a condemnation of women blinds to the real reason that we have it in the first place, why it is worthy of being bound within the pages of the Bible and passed down. We carry the quarrel between Euodia and Syntyche because of Paul's urging words to them are a lesson to all of us who have ever felt a need or experienced a comfort or have the simple desire to belong together in the journey of this faith. Because while within it our attention might be on the divine, number three, this church, the church, is a very human thing. Yes, there is grace, there is redemption, there is spirit, but if you look around, there's a heck of a lot of flesh and bone, too. A heck of a lot of our successes and our failures, our dreams seized and dashed, our hopes raised and crushed, our fears alleviated and justified. If you look around, there's a lot of joy and a lot of pain. There's a lot of traumas healed and a, and a lot of traumas still hurting. And we human beings, when we gather together, bringing all of that with us for all of our best intentions and hopes, we have a terrible habit of hurting the people we seek to be closest to, of lashing out to those who would offer us comfort, of pushing away those with whom we have much in common, of being a bit ugly to those who show us beauty. We step in that often. We will step in that in the future. And Paul, knowing this, knowing the truth about this, knowing that it is what probably has transpired between Euodia and, Syn uh, and Syntyche, and you and me, knowing this also to be true about our lived experience as well, what does Paul say into such bickering and infighting? about our propensity to be a little bit mean when we shouldn't be, to find a anthill and turn it into Mount Everest. What does Paul write? 
he takes his pen to paper and he writes to Euodia and Syntyche and all of Philippi and to you and me today and every member of every church. He says, let your gentleness be known by everyone. Do not allow yourself to become hardened without cause against a sibling in faith. When the journey together becomes rough, and it will, and maybe it has, when you disagree and bitterness climbs inside, do not feed it the harshness of your resentment. Instead, Recall all of those things that inspired you to the faith, to the community that brought you here together in the first place. And if in the middle of your bitterness and anger, those things still ring true like the clearest bell, if they are still an open avenue to Christ's holy peace, then, oh my goodness, allow them in to do their work, to soften your jaggedness, to cool your temper. Because allowing the gentleness of Christ in, it corrects our vision, it recalibrates our perspective, even if we don't want to. It creates the possibility for unity again. The difficulties between us that rise up, they cannot be fully avoided. They happen. To believe that they can be avoided or edited out of how we live, that is a terrible harshness you are doing to yourself. Let go of that. And instead, deal gently and keep close, as Paul says, keep close to all that is true and all that is honorable, to all that is just and pure and pleasing and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise, not because they fix it, not because they keep it from happening, not because they turn you and change you in such a way that you will never fight again, that you will never roll your eyes again, that you will never cross anyone again, but because when we humans get together and those human things happen, they lead us back to the wholeness of God and Christ and to the church together. Amen.